So far, we've been talking about selecting certain animals for breeding. There are artificial um, selection and also um, your natural selection. So we're just going to continue with our artificial selection. So generally, we do this because animals need to be bred with on farms and so on by breeders. And basically, animal breeding is that process of selecting certain characteristics that we see in individuals. And we hope that those characteristics can genetically be passed on. So then we allow those individuals with the characteristics that we see to mate and then hopefully they pass on those genes and alleles and then with those offspring, with their offsprings we can see those characteristics in the next generation. So now we're going to look at specific types of breeding systems. So the first one we're all familiar with is basically inbreeding. So with inbreeding here we have a nice diagram showing two parents having three kids and with inbreeding you allow closely related individuals, in this case brother and sister, <coughs> to mate. In this case, it's actually very nice. They show us where the alleles are, and you have you need a recessive allele, two recessive alleles to see a new phenotype. So in this case, all the bunnies are grey, but now all of a sudden you see a brown bunny, and this was only possible because you need the um, small recessive alleles to be able to pass on and give it. And the one thing I just want to mention about this with inbreeding, generally why we need to take family members and not two random bunnies and allow them to mate, is usually family members, uh, you, you see these alleles in the family, because here we see that this allele was passed on from, they say this is the mother, to two of her children. Yes, if you do not do a genetic test, there is no way for a breeder to actually know which ones have that allele, um, but generally either you can do a genetic test or Farmers just um, take basically two um, siblings and allow them to mate and then hopefully you see eventually um, this phenotype that you want to see. Because in the, in the essence, that's, that these two were allowed to mate, it will also be um, grey bunnies but not brown. But it's a risk one has to take. But generally in a family uh, line, it's, you see these recessive alleles much more easily because it is a rare, usually whatever, not, depends on the characteristic, but many things are rare and they will not pass on, you won't find those alleles just in any random bunny, um, in this case, um, outside. If it is in a family setup, it usually is easier to find these recessive alleles. So the chances of them being there and then being passed on to the next generation is so much, um, it just, it, it happens more often. It's easier to happen, um, better term. So in this case, if the phenotype that you were looking for is brown bunnies, you must know that there is, uh, there has been brown bunnies in this family line before. Otherwise, how do you know the characteristic was there? And then it will cause this characteristic then to come into the next generation when these two alleles happen to align together, uh, fertilize the gametes and so on, and then you get this individual. So basically, in a nutshell, inbreeding is breeding related, closely related individuals to heighten the characteristic you want to see in the offspring. So the advantage then is that, yes, it strengthens a good trait. So in this case, if the brown color is a good thing, or if it's good for the breeder, um, then it will strengthen it, meaning you'll see it more often in the offspring and the offspring's offspring. Then also there is a tendency for a string, strong prepotency. So generally, whatever the characteristic is, sometimes there's one parent that often will dominate um, its offspring. Meaning it will the chances of it passing it on to its offspring is very good. We did prepotency in one of the previous um, lessons, and basically that means when one parent gives more alleles or more genes to its offspring. So generally with inbreeding, we see this, meaning in this case, in this case it was both parents, but generally it's one parent gives a specific allele or a gene to the offspring. So generally we do see this happen within a family line. Then your disadvantages, unfortunately it can also strengthen your bad traits. I mean, in this um, slide, it's actually more to do with bad characteristics, meaning if the gray uh, color in this case was a good thing, it ensures the survival of the bunny species. Um, that's a good thing, but now as soon as the brown color comes, it can't camouflage for argument's sake, and now it can easily be um, caught by a predator. So in this case, it's a bad characteristic. So with the good characteristics we want to, um, to see in the offspring, which is good for us as breeders, but now at the same time, we can also strengthen bad traits that could potentially harm the, the individual. 
So then also lastly, it also causes less genetic variation. So as we can see here, in the family over here, we have a homozygous dominant individual. So that's a possibility to see, we see the capital A alleles. And we have a heterozygous one. So both capital A and small a. So there's genetic variation. We see different types of alleles. Now, all of a sudden, with this individual, we only see two small a's. So meaning if this one were to mate with another brown bunny, they'll only ever in their lifetime be able to produce brown bunnies. That is it. We will never see again in their offspring gray bunnies. So it technically is less variation. There's less, there's no more different alleles, and we don't see any other phenotypes. So generally, that is actually quite bad. So a different second type is line breeding. So line breeding is actually the same as inbreeding. It's a type of inbreeding, but the way it differs as is we are not breeding with closely, very closely related individuals. We are um, now breeding with slightly more distant related individuals. So in this diagram, we can see that here is, and so here are three um, siblings, let's say um, sister and two brothers, and this one had two children. Now, this one, in essence, if it was uh, a male, is the nephew of this one, and this one is the aunt of this one. They are related. They are blood relation, genetically related, but now they are allowed to mate and have offspring. So say this one was a specific color, this one was also a specific color, the breeder will allow them to mate because we want to see that color in the offspring as well. So line breeding uses family members, but not closely related. So it's not brother and sister, it's in this case aunt and nephew. So the advantages and disadvantages is exactly the same as inbreeding because it is a type of inbreeding. So then the third type you get is outbreeding. So outbreeding is generally what we want to see in any breeding system. It allows for more genetic variation, basically. So this side time diagram does show us again inbreeding, just in the horses, same example as the rabbits. But over here is what we see for the outbreeding. So if there is one individual that happens to have a bad allele, so let's say this is the allele for uh, blindness, but this horse can see because it has the capital A allele, so it is normal. But again, if it were to um, mate with an individual that's also heterozygous that could potentially produce an offspring that is blind. But without breeding, now a random horse, unrelated from this horse, is allowed to mate with it. It happens to be homozygous dominant in this case, meaning it has different alleles. The chances of it randomly also having the recessive allele is very, very rare. So this is a good thing. So now the offspring, yeah, okay, happens to be heterozygous, but luckily this horse is not blind. That's technically what we want to see. We want to use this method of outbreeding using completely unrelated individuals because it also brings um, heterosis basically into the offspring, meaning it, it causes genetic variation in your offspring. So yes, the advantage then is increases your genetic variety. It also reduces the effect of any recessive traits like we just demonstrated here. Then with your disadvantages, hybrids in this case, it's a mixture of two different individuals to different gene um, pools, hybrids may not show desired traits. So if in essence we wanted to again select for certain colors, um, this entire family, let's say all of them are black, but these ones are brown, we, and we wanted to see actually black full continuum, it's possible that this one then would be a mixture of black and brown, maybe black with brown spots, or completely brown, whichever. So it may not show that trait we wanted to see in the family line based on the fact that we're bringing, out, bringing in new genes. So it could be that our desired traits are not seen then, and also new undesired traits could be seen. So maybe this individual on its other, other gene, it brought alleles with it, but maybe potentially can cause um, lameness, uh, random lameness in horses. So it's something that we didn't want to select for, but happened to be in this individual, and now this undesired trait can pass on to the offspring. Then also we have the crossbreeding system. So crossbreeding and outbreeding is basically the same thing, just a little bit different. So crossbreeding mainly is you take, it's also um, unrelated individuals, but now it's completely unrelated in the sense that there are different breeds. So in this case, here we have a bull that is breed A, for argument's sake, we can call this the Afrikaner, 
and cow breed uh, number B is completely different breed. In this case, let's say it's a Hereford. So this individual then will be a crossbred offspring. It'll be 50% of its dad, 50% of its mum. So it's not any more purebred. It's not a Hereford any, um, anymore, and it's not an Afrikaner. It's half Afrikaner, half um, Hereford. I can't remember the breed I said. So it's half and half. It's actually a new breed now. So it's a mixture of these two breeds. So the advantage of this is it definitely ensures heterosis. So heterosis, think of heterozygosity. I mean, it's going to be heterozygous. It's going to be, have two different alleles for a specific gene. Um, so that's good because now it literally is a mixture of these two individuals. It generally has a better immune system, maybe more pest resistant, things that one of its parents maybe is not. So it's genetically better and it makes it phenotypically also better usually. So with this method, you can also develop new breeds because technically this individual now is a new breed in essence. We can't call it something it hasn't been named anything, a mixture of Afrikaner and Hereford, but it is it's an, it's essentially a new breed because it's completely different than its parents. Disadvantages though is more than one male is needed to be effective. So if you had a big breed, a big herd, sorry, of let's say um, Hereford individuals and you wanted to make more crossbreed offspring, you'll have to have more than one bull because in this case there's only one Afrikaner bull and it cannot mate with all the, well, maybe the entire herd, fine, but if you want to go on with this progeny and you want this individual maybe later on to be, to get more genetic diverse, meaning its offspring, so you want to use a different breed with, with its, with it to, to give different offspring, you can't use its dad with it. Well, technically you can, it's also a type of line breeding, but genetically that's going to be very bad. So you want to have another completely unrelated Afrikaner bull to put with this cow so that the offspring then is different again. So you need more than one male. Otherwise you end up with inbreeding all again and crossbreeding again as a type of outbreeding. So you do want unrelated individuals. So the second bullet there, hybrids may show undesirable traits. Again, we don't know whether this bull had bad characteristics that was suppressed and we don't see it in the phenotype and now it's been passed on to its offspring. So unfortunately with the hybrids, there could be some characteristics that, that slips through the cracks. And now let's say this individual is blind where none of its parents were blind, but this one had the legal for blindness. So that was unintentional. Then we have upgrading. So upgrading is actually something that takes a long time to do, but it's very it's a cheap method of getting your herd to a pedigree level. And with that, I mean they are okay. They could have more weight. They could produce more milk. All these characteristics again that we want that breeders look for. So with upgrading, usually you've got a individual that's usually inferior and one that's superior. Okay, let's make it the other way around. This one's the bull. So let's make the bull superior. So this is the type of breed, also different breeds, that you want to go for. Let's make this bull again Afrikaner. So you want actually all your cattle to look like the Afrikaner breed, but you have a, a bunch of cows that are Herefords. Let's use that again. So in your mind, in the breeder's mind, Hereford is inferior. You want to bring in more Afrikaner blood. So what you use then is you crossbreed again, get offspring that's 50-50, but then you use um, this bull again from um, bull B. Uh, in this case, I see they rotate between A, B, A, B the whole time, but you can also do it in a, bull, a, B, a breed that is bull B, 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 B the whole time. So not necessarily the same bull, but different bulls, but of the same breed. So here we have again 50 50 so then you put again a type of bull that's breed b more afrikaner 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 and eventually you'll get individuals that look more like the afrikaner breed so this is a cheaper method of getting your entire herd the offspring to look like the afrikaner without you actually buying a completely new herd of afrikaner individuals so it's going to take longer, maybe five years, 10 years to get all the offspring and their offspring to look like Afrikaner cattle. But it is definitely a cheaper way than you're going and buying um, all of them together and having a completely big, um, big herd with Afrikaner individuals. So economically, it's, bit, it's better this way to get to that pedigree level, to get them all of them the same breed. Well, closely anyway, you'll never get to 100% 
Africana, it, there's still going to be some um, genetic information there coming from the Hereford line. Okay, so also it ensures less unwanted traits compared to inbreeding. So it's, it's not really inbreeding because, again, you can use different types of bulls, but they are from the same breed. So usually this is um, unrelated individual, so it is better than inbreeding. So then disadvantages, unfortunately, like I mentioned, it is time consuming. It's going to take a couple of years to allow your herd to actually look a certain way, uh, in, like a certain breed you want. And also, there are generally slow improvement after the third generation, meaning, as we can see here now, all of a sudden, after breeding once, two different breeds, they're 50-50. Then after a while, they become 25-75. If you again put the Africana there, so the Africana amount of alleles will be 75%, then 62%, 37 blah, 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 and eventually, you will never get to zero. You'll never get 100% Africana. So as time goes by, less and less alleles gets added. You can see from a mathematical standpoint. Then also we have species crossing. So this I think everybody is familiar with. So this is when you cross two completely different species, in this case a horse and a donkey. They are genetically related because they are of the equine family um, for hooved animals, but they are different species, they've got different amount of chromosomes, but they can be crossed and produce a completely a new offspring that is a new species. I mean, a mule is not a donkey and it's not a horse, it's something in between. But something to remember about this is that donkeys are sterile. So even though we do say they are a new type of species, they are not really a species because species, by the definition, are able to mate and reproduce, and these guys can't reproduce. Every time you want a new mule, you have to allow a horse and a donkey to mate to give you more mules. So they're kind of like the freaks of nature. There's something in between. They can live. Sometimes they don't survive as, um, as many years as, say, horses and donkeys, but they have good characteristics. They're stronger, say, than a horse and less stubborn than a donkey. So with your advantages, yes, they are harder working animals and they usually have better disease resistance, um, heat tolerance, all those good things. And like I say, they're less stubborn. So generally, they are good pack animals to use. Um, then with your disadvantages, yes, your offspring are sterile, so you cannot breed with them. And this actually creating mules are really used in breeding systems because only so few people really want to use mules. Yes, they are stronger and they can last longer with, little, with less feed, but generally it's just easier to use horses and donkeys. If it happens in nature or in a paddock that the mules do form, they can be used. But generally it's not a real breeding system. We don't have breeding books breeding mules. There are so many pedigree levels of horses and donkeys and, and not really mules. So it's just a rare thing to use. And that is it for this lesson.